Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and welcome to Finding Me in the ITV Networks today with my very special guest, Umar Shokud. Umar is a research fellow at the Afro-Middle East Center and at the moment he is focusing intensively on understanding, interpreting and perhaps explaining much of what we find Muslims are very preoccupied with and that is the Islamic State, ISIS or ISIL, whichever we, one you choose to, to call them. Umar has also discussed extensively on the Syrian crisis and raised many interesting comments on the Syrian issue. But for our focus today is on the Islamic State because for me especially I think that there are very many questions and we need to unpack this of course from somebody who has done intensive research. So with that, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you for being here and for of course sharing this platform with me. I, I know that almost every day you open the newspaper, you look at your Twitter feeds, you listen to the radio, there's a discussion on the Islamic State. It's coming from all walks of life from different spheres and, and, and individuals, media, academics. So there's much to be discussed. But I think a starting point for many Muslims would be is, who is ISIS? How did they suddenly just come about? Like, who's this Baghdadi fellow? You know, I hear the young people saying, like, well, where did he come from? So perhaps if you can just, as a starting point, give us a little background on the history of the Islamic State. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, secondly, Bismillah. So, as far as ISIS's history is concerned, you know, this group has been around for a long time. Uh, we generally started to hear of this in the popular media in, in June of this year. Mm. But uh, one version or the other of the group has been around since 2006. At that time, it was called the Islamic State of Iraq. And then it be, you know, was called Islamic State of Iraq and, and a Sham, a Sham being Assyria um, or the Levant, however you want to translate it. And now it's called uh, the Islamic State. And uh, even before that, there is a history of the group. Uh, it has to do with uh, its uh, earlier founder, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. He never founded the Islamic State of Iraq. He founded an organization which predated this, but mm -hmm. eventually morphed into the Islamic State of Iraq. And he was killed by the American strikes in 2006. So, so, so there's a very long history to be told. And there's a lot of literature already now out on, on Zarqawi's life. Um, so, so I mean, I'm not going to go into that, but uh, more, just more about this group initially was thought to be in alliance with Al Qaeda. What that alliance consisted of is debated. Some people have suggested, especially those who are sympathetic to Al Qaeda, more so than the Islamic State, that uh, the leaders of this group had given uh, official bayah, you mm -hmm. know, like an allegiance, allegiance yeah. to to the uh, uh, Osama bin Laden at that time. Um, they have, I mean, Islamic State now, now that they've officially sort of parted ways with Al-Qaeda, they have denied that. Um, and, and, and like I said, there is a deb debate about it. I, I, I would, would not feel comfortable saying one way or the other whether the bayah was given or not. But uh, it is important that this debate is understood because it points to a very early, since 2006 um, and before, the differences that existed between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. Mm. And I think the two most important ones for our purpose right now are uh, this debate over uh, the near enemy and the far enemy. That's the first issue. And the second issue is how do you deal with Muslims that you don't agree with? Mm. Um, and uh, so one of the first things that uh, Abu, sorry, Ewan Azwahiri, who was the second in command of Al-Qaeda at that time, he criticized um, uh, Islamic State and its earlier sort of incarnations that uh, they tend to be very, very brutal when it comes to dealing with other Muslims. And they tend to make a spectacle mm. out of the violence that they commit. So that is one issue that even now you see Al-Qaeda is not really releasing any of these beheading kind of videos, whereas it's the Islamic State is. So that's one issue. And the other one issue, uh, the other issue, that I, like I said, was this disagreement over near enemy and far enemy. And uh, that can be understood primarily as the near enemy is what the Islamic State uh, and the Islamic State in Iraq at that time wanted to focus on, which is fighting the, the Shia uh, or the local uh, rulers in the Arab world. 
uh, and then at the third level, they would tend to focus on fighting the Americans or the Zionists or the Israelis, you know, yeah. whatever you want to call them. Uh, Al Qaeda, on the other hand, wanted to focus more on uh, the U.S. You know, the, the so you can think of it this way: ISIS wants to focus on what's immediately in front of them, but Al Qaeda says that there are people who are controlling what's immediately in front of them, and they need to be targeted first. Hmm. And even the reasons behind this, there's a very particular history to be told about how Al Qaeda came to be and what they suffered from. And so, and anyway, it's a very complicated history. But that's the basic way in which I would describe this disagreement between the two groups. Now, considering the near enemy and the far enemy, we can understand the logic of Al Qaeda that go for the far enemy first because, I mean, they, they're looking at the superpowers or controlling the puppet regimes. I, as you, as you say, is looking at the local structures. But as a Muslim, and, and you're in that particular area, and you're, you're, you're facing this, this strife, this hardship, this suppression, which is very much um, reliving colonial or imperialistic um, structures on your daily life, and you know that it infringes on your beliefs, on your identity, etc. It's basically the imperialists telling you how to behave through leaders which they have put in place for you. If I was somebody who had to choose, I would also go the local way. I believe start with those who are closest to me. These are the ones who are supposed to be a part of us, uh, who are supposed to represent us. But in actual fact, they are the ones who are causing us the greater harm. And so we need to remove them and put in enemies who will, uh, I mean, sorry, put in leaders who will probably uh, do a better job at representing us. Right. Why do you think then Al Qaeda has chosen to focus on the far enemy instead of the near enemy? You know, like I said, I mean, there's a particular history to be told, and and maybe the shortest way of telling that history would be to say um, elements uh, within who came out of the Muslim Brotherhood and formed their own group that targeted Anwar al-Sadat in Egypt. Mm. Uh, they thought this would be a successful way to change um, the local enemy, but they ended up getting Hosni Mubarak. Um, who turned out to be more brutal than Sadat, who actually had made much, many reconciliatory gestures towards uh, the Ikhwan and other affiliated groups. So the, one of the lessons that they learned from that was that um, you can try to change the local enemy uh, and bring about a new one, but really the people who control what's happening in Egypt are the imperialist powers outside of mm. Egypt. So that's why they wanted to focus on, on taking the fight to the U.S. So, so that's one reason why Al-Qaeda preferred to go uh, the far enemy road. Now, what, like you were saying, I mean, yes, there are many reasons which, you know, fighting the local enemy makes more sense. And I think one of the things, um, again, I won't focus on a whole range of issues, but one of the reasons through which we can understand why the Islamic State would want to focus on th uh, fighting, fighting the local enemy is actually when it comes to finding recruits, it's much easier. Hmm. Because when you're talking about far enemy, you need people who are much more ideological. Um, and um, that is not always to be the case, but it's far easier to find people who somebody in their family was killed or raped or, or, or you know, they've mm -hmm. just in general experienced from some kind of problems from local rulers. And even if not that, you know, in, in, especially in Iraq, I mean, with the, with the U.S. over there uh, 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 occupying Iraq, it was very easy to sort of collapse that distinction between near enemy and far mm -hmm. enemy and say, look, whoever's in front of you, that needs to be fought. So from a recruitment, tactical, strategic perspective, I mean, it is, it is a better way to go. You need less far ideological people. Okay, so considering the leadership, you, you said that the, the extension of the leadership began for Islamic State in 2006. Um, that is after the break away from Al-Qaeda. Tell us a little bit more about this leadership of the Islamic State and, and Baghdadi. Who is he? What does yeah. he represent? Yeah, I mean, so Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, you know, that's yeah. his, uh, really, I mean, you know, he's known within his followers as, as Khalif Ibrahim. Mm. Um, so, again, it's expected, first of all, let me say this that we, we wouldn't know a whole lot about these people. Mm. Uh, not knowing about these people leads to all kinds of conspiracy theorizing, and I want to stay away from that right now. But uh, right now we have, I think, two accounts of uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. One of them is from somebody who is sympathetic to him, okay. uh, from uh, a scholar uh, who, and when I say scholar, I'm not saying this because I'm necessarily recognizing these people as yes. scholars, but within their circles, they recognize the scholars. Uh, so one person, a Bahraini, uh, who has written a biography of uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, he, he tells us that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi has a PhD from the Islamic University of Baghdad okay. uh, in Tajweed. 
and uh, he was uh, an imam in many of the masajid from Fallujah in Iraq and uh, sorry in Mosul mm-hmm. uh, in in Basra. So I mean, so there's a whole story to History be told about there, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh. but uh, so 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 he has credentials which uh, would make him look like a scholar okay. in the eyes of his followers who believed this this biography. Mm. Now on the other hand, we have uh, we have one kind of this other kind of biography which essentially says that when he was at uh, University of Baghdad, he was a dropout. He he didn't really focus on his studies. Uh, and, and and this account is actually not a written biography. This is more... Commentary. Te- yeah, testimonies mm-hmm. that have been collected by this, you know, various mm-hmm. journalists from mm-hmm. people who might have known him. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, I mean, it, it's, it's an account that's put together. It's not one jami, as we might say in Arabic, you know, like in one yeah. place. So is there no way of verifying? Is there, like, don't the universities have records or stuff like that, you know, to say that somebody's attended, somebody's going No, to... I mean, he was enrolled. That's okay. what it looks like. Whether okay. he finished or not is, is up for debate. Okay. Uh, but uh, the larger issue over here is that uh, he was at some point arrested. Uh, why he was arrested by the Americans is also up for debate uh, because uh, we don't really know whether he was a small guy in the organization or was he some big guy. I think it's a better uh, assumption because his name wasn't really, if he had been a big guy, mm. you know, the U.S. wouldn't have let him off so easily. Mm. So I think it's, it's better to assume that he was not some, some big figure, but he was a smaller operative. And then when he was in prison with the U.S., he, he came in touch with many other Insurgents who would become leader of the Islamic st- leaders in the Islamic State. Now. Okay, but I have to stop you there. We're going to keep our viewers in suspense. Uh, we'll take the discussion further. We'll see you after the break. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi and welcome to the second segment of Finding Me Today and the ITV networks with my very special guest, Omar Shokut, and we're talking about the IS or the Islamic State. And before we went into the break, uh, Omar explaining, was explaining to us about the rise of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and of course the fact that he had been imprisoned by the Americans. And this has probably uh, generated a whole new development or perhaps an ideological um, change in the way he perceived things, which has promoted the the Khalifa, if one may say, of the Islamic State. But let's take this spy story or this conspiracy a little further and let's unpack what we do know and what we ha- are left to assume, I suppose. So you said that he was in U.S. custody. What happens then? Uh, again, we don't know what happened within the U.S. custody. We know that he was put at Kambuka where he was. he came in touch with many of the ex Baathists. I shouldn't say ex-Baathists, but they were all Baathists. Yeah. But they were ex-leaders of, of Iraq uh, mm-hmm. who had been removed from So the position. Sunni leaders also, basically. Yeah, they basically. were all Sunni leaders, and yeah. they came together. And uh, some of these leaders might have at some point or the other become more Islamicized, if I might use that word. Uh, but the larger point is... Sorry, go ahead. No, but may I in- interrupt? Sure. When you say Islamicized, are you trying to say that they've become uh, more in touch with the Islamic identity? Or are you referring to, to the way the negative connotation in, in which the Western media says Islamicized, meaning fundamental extremist? Yeah. Uh, w- no, 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 thanks, thanks yeah. for clarifying yeah. that. No, I don't mean it in the second way. Okay. Uh, I just meant that uh, the Baathists initially, um, and I think even... If taking into account the kinds of attempt at uh, presenting a more Islamic face that uh, Saddam Hussein did towards the end of his reign, mm-hmm. uh, they in generally in general they tended to be much more secular. Okay. So that's what I just mean that mm-hmm. when they were becoming more Islamicized again, if I might use that mm-hmm. word, is to say that they might have been they might have started thinking about how to construct their ideology, how to mount a resistance, and how to sell that resistance to the larger Iraqi population in Islamic terms. Mm. Not necessarily that they're becoming fundamentalist or, you okay. know, that's not, that's mm. not what I mean. But uh, anyway, so, so, so they all, these people came together um, and many of them, uh, when they were let off uh, by the US, and why they were let off, again, we don't really know. You know, that, that again, like I said earlier on, mm. has led to a certain kind of conspiracy theorizing that these people are controlled by the US. But uh, when they were let out, in 2010, eventually, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, uh, who at that time, according to the sympathetic biography, 
uh, was part of uh, this, this sort of Shura Council of, mm -hmm. of the group. He was elected to the to the to the leadership position. You know, he was recognized as the Imam of the group, and uh, that is when we see him taking over charge of the Islamic State in, in Iraq at that time in 2010. Mm. Uh, before him, the leader, um, you could potentially say there were two leaders, but they were both killed. Uh, we don't really know at which point what they exactly killed, but you know, we do know that they were removed and that's why they, mm. you had to get a new leader. Um, and since Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi came to power, um, the group has dramatically seen an upsurge in its recruitment and its popularity, obviously leading up to where we are right now. And uh, one of the things that they, that they did um, was uh, very early when the Syrian crisis started, they wanted to expand into Syria and, and you know, pr uh, present mm. a face of the organization within Syria. Uh, initially, everybody thought that this is part of uh, an Al-Qaeda group. You know, Islamic State was considered to be part of Al-Qaeda, so this is an extension of Al-Qaeda. The disagreement over this issue, whether this group, the new group that uh, the Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's fighters had put in place in Syria, which is now known as Jabhat al-Nusra. Actually, it was always known, mm. known as Jabhat al-Nusra. Um, in 2018, this, this, this agreement, how they belong to and how they relate to Al-Qaeda came to the fore, and it, was a, it led to a pretty b bloody battle, uh, especially towards the beginning of this year, in which um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi asserted that his authority trumps the authority of Eman al-Zawahiri. Hmm. Uh, Eman al-Zawahiri, on the other hand, asserted that, no, Abu, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi should technically be under him. So he told him, uh, as in Zawahiri told uh, Baghdadi to go back into Iraq and operate within that um, framework of Iraq and let Jabhat al-Nusra operate in Syria. Mm. Uh, it was at that time, this is the middle, around the middle of last year, that, um, last year I mean 2013, uh, uh, that uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi came out with pretty harsh words of, of you know, and uh, uh, Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, uh, the spokesperson, official spokesperson, insofar as one can be of this group, uh, came out and they criticized Eman al-Zawahiri for restricting themselves to the nation state boundaries mm. of the Sykes-Pico arrangement. And the way they, they formulated their criticism, it came pretty close to suggesting that uh, Eman al-Zawahiri might be a kafir himself for believing this. Um, so anyway, so these, this, these disagreements had been building up. And uh, as these disagreements had been building up, the popularity within certain sections of the larger jihadi world of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was also surging. And uh, generally, people who study this material have said there's a big division between the older generation and the younger generation. Mm. The older generation has tended to go along with al-Qaeda uh, and, the, and their leadership, and they haven't sided with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, but the younger folks have sided with Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi one reason might be his brazenness in actually taking on what, you know, who might be Nobody considered else, the biggest yeah, leader yeah. of the jihadi world at that time. Oh. Uh, but also at the same time, I mean, they were militarily gaining uh, ground. Oh. So, so while I was telling you about, you know, in, this, in these intervening years, this, this, this agreement with Al-Qaeda was unfolding, also on the uh, uh, during the same time period, uh, they were gaining ground starting from uh, the Fallujah, uh, uh, the Ambar province in Iraq, and also in Mosul, where effectively they were already, even before they take over right now, they were present as extortionists, as, uh, as people who were in many ways, you know, managing local, mm. if not the whole city, but at least small parts of the cities. Um, and also breaking prisoners out of prisons. For a whole year, they, they just engaged in that campaign. And um, so, so they were building up, you know, one might say street cred for, uh, credentials for themselves. Okay, but as you're speaking, I, I see now there's an ideological shift. But there's an ideological shift Islamically, and there's an ideological shift in terms of secular understanding of what is the nation state, what is the boundaries, and how the Islamic state should look. That's the difference between Al-Qaeda and the Islamic state. But you also said that they were building up the street credibility by doing certain actions. And if you, if you, I understand extortionists the way it's normally understood, then that is not Islamic behavior. So how does then one build the credibility of an Islamic state by doing un-Islamic things? I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not going to comment on how, what, what they're doing is Islamic or not, because, you know, there are people who are sympathetic to them yes. who might consider what they're doing as, as Islamic. Some other people might not. But let me just tell you, um, let me describe to you the scenario. Okay. And then, you know, maybe you can think about how one would sort of think through this issue Islamically. 
Um, imagine a uh, security force in a region in which the security force is already engaging in extortion, mm. right? Let's just use this word unpolitically right now, uh, in which they show up at your, at your store and they say, um, X amount of money at the end of the week, if you don't, we'll, we'll take away your son, put him in jail, call him a terrorist, and that, that will be the end of the story. Mm -hmm. So if the security force, official security force of the country is engaging in that action, somebody else comes along, fights the security force off, says this small locality is under our control, and now, anybody who's living within this locality must pay uh, money to us. But that would be like a jizya or a tax, isn't it? Not necessarily jizya, because that, that only it's technically applies to like yeah, non-Christians yeah. you know, yeah. and uh, Ahlul Kitab. Yeah. But uh, the larger point is, when they do something like that, some people within the locality might actually say, you know what, we were already paying taxes to the government, we might as well pay it to these guys. Mm. So I'm saying it's not necessarily, when I say extortion, uh, yeah, I, I have to be careful because mm -hmm. it sounds bad, but depending on your perspective. The context also. In, yeah, depending yeah. on the context, you yeah. might actually think Islamic State controlling a, a certain locality was beneficial rather than the Iraqi security forces controlling that area. Um, again, it depends on how rich you are, what your sectarian background is, how well you're connected with the tribes. So all of those factors factor in. Um, and um, so anyway, you know, yes. you can decide yes. what is Islamic and what is not. But uh, look, considering the fundamental of Islam, the fundamental of Islam is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explained to the prophets, uh, he explained why he, in the Quran, he says why he really, uh, why he sent the prophets, why he sent the messengers, why he sent the books. Everywhere he says it was to establish justice. Okay, so if Islamic State is going to come about or is here, then the first priority is the establishing of justice. In what way can we say that there is now this whole movement that is being set about from the, from the literature that you have read, from the analysis that you have done? Can you, in your own mind, putting aside everything, you know, whatever you feel religiously in terms of your academic understanding, and say, when you read this, you say, this is justice. Do you find that when you're reading the literature or yeah. doing the analysis? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't think I can put my academic lenses aside. Okay. Um, but let me just put it this way. Um, what is justice depends on your perspective and your context as well. Mm. So, for example, um, killing uh, Peter Kasich. Let's just take this recent yes. example. Um, some people who have supported uh, I ISIS decision, even if they're not necessarily part of ISIS, uh, ISIS and, and you know that they might have had any role to play in the decision-making process behind the killing of Peter Kasich, if the killing is true. Let's just assume it is. Um, some of them are saying, you know, he converted under duress. So his conversion, if he converted at all, does not count. So he's not a Muslim. Some other people are saying, you know, he actually was a spy. Because he was already active in the military, all of his humanitarian work was really just an effort to cover up his uh, work for the US military. Mm. So again, what I'm saying is, it depends on how you read the situation. Because these people would say what they're doing is Islamic. But how they're understanding what Peter Kasich did, what his history is, and what the reasons for which the IS might have killed him, you know, you, you will get different answers. So broadly, we can all agree that Islam establishes justice. But in a particular context, what justice is, is obviously up for debate. Okay, so we're going to have to leave it there. We're going to go to a second interview, which I will present to my viewers in the following week. But I would like you to think about this in the meanwhile. What is justice? And what does Islam say about justice? Until we meet again next week, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.